In the mid-1960s, Taiwan's economy really takes off. In real terms, it grows by you know, over 10% per year. And export growth is even faster than that. Before the mid-1960s, people looked at Taiwan and saw a relatively successful developing economy. By the late 1960s, early 1970s, they're looking at Taiwan and they're saying, wow, what happened to this place? How has it suddenly started growing so fast? Well, I'm going to argue that Taiwan did experience some change. In particular, its economy went back to being a more open market economy as it was before World War II. But of course, it was doing much better now than it had been doing before World War II. And I'm going to argue that's mainly because of the changes in the world economy. Before World War II, the world economy, at least as far as international trade is concerned, was rather slow moving. There was slow communication, slow transportation. So there wasn't a lot of advantage to having fast production and flexible production networks like Taiwan had. After World War II, we start seeing everything speeding up. And as things speeded up, Taiwan's comparative advantage became more and more valuable. And Taiwan became richer and richer. Now, what's changed? One thing that's changing during this period is this is the period of the U.S. retail revolution. And these retail revolutions will eventually affect most of the developed world and eventually the, the developing world. This is a period you start seeing chains and franchising. Okay, so before the World War II, each city would have its own individual kind of ma and pa stores. Now you've got stores linked up, hundreds of stores all in one chain or you know, all in one franchise from California all the way over to New York. Department stores also start combining and chaining, okay, so that you get department stores that have more than one big outlet and they're in more than one city. You have the creation of shopping malls that goes along with this. Now, instead of each individual um, you know, shop trying to figure out, just looking around trying to figure out what's the, the best place to, to open its shop, you have people that specialize in trying to create um, shopping environments that will draw in customers. And then the shops, these new chains and franchises, they start locating in these shopping centers. Uh, that makes shopping much more convenient and much more enjoyable. Okay, so this also kind of helps this boom in consumer goods. You also see a big increase in advertising. This is maybe primarily because of TV, but also because now you have these chains that are located all across the country that are willing to advertise nationwide. Advertising, you know, is, is something that will not just increase demand, but increases kind of the speed of demand. You know, they can, they can make you suddenly, everybody wants a certain thing they see advertised on TV. After a few months, they start advertising something new and maybe demand changes. Okay. So um, the, the advertising also has a big effect on what's happening to, to world markets. Now, why are these markets changing? Mainly communications and transportation. This is changing, changing real, real what, retailing. It's also though changing the whole world economy. Before World War II, if you were going to want to talk to somebody across the ocean, maybe the most practical thing to do would be send them a telegram. Okay. Telegrams were fast, pretty much fast, probably a day. You could probably reach the person. Um, but um, you know, they were very expensive, so telegrams were very short. You couldn't say much. If you wanted to say a lot, you probably had to send a letter. Okay? But letters are very slow. I remember even in 1980 when I would send a letter C-mail back to the United States. You know, it would take at least a month to get there. And so that's why you always paid a little extra and sent it airmail. Um, this is also just one-way communications. Okay? You, you can't talk back and forth. Okay? You need phones to do that. 1934 is when you had the first radio telephone call from the U.S. to Asia. But this is still just kind of an experimental thing. It's, it's a rarity. Maybe a, a government in an emergency might use it. It's not something a business would use regularly. Only after World War II do you start seeing this sort of inner ocean, you know, cross-ocean telephone service. 1955 is when you get the first transoceanic telephone cable. So now, you know, that makes it much more, you know, uh, much cheaper um, to, to talk across the ocean. 1962, the Communications Satellite Act. 
that allows for a lot more communication satellites. Now you can use these communication satellites also to talk across the ocean. When you look at outgoing international phone calls from Taiwan, I've got that in this graph here. It's a log graph so that you can more easily see you know, the rate of change okay, and, and what's happening you know, in, in the growth in telephone calling. This is in minutes per person. Basically up until 1965, people talk less than a second a person per year. Okay, It was just very rare to make an international telephone call. After 1965, you can see that the fastest growth is probably 1965 to 1975. You get up to a minute per person, and then it keeps growing. Um, by the time we reach the peak, we're up to over 100 minutes per person, maybe 200 minutes per person. Then this starts falling, okay, and the, the fall, of course, is due to the Internet. Now there's an even better way to talk to people abroad. But this is very important. If you're going to do products like consumer goods that are subject to fashion, uh, that are subject to technological change, um, you've got to have communications open to talk back and forth because there's always going to be problems that so you've got to solve quickly. And so this is this telephones becomes a you know a really important instrument for business. Transportation is also key. Okay, the big changes in transportation. The biggest change is probably container shipping. This was something created by Malcolm McLean. He tried to, he, he, he had this idea. He started doing container shipping along the U.S. coast, and then gradually it goes international. Container shipping is where instead of um, putting goods just loose in a, in a ship's hold, you put them into boxes. These boxes are the right size, and when you get to the harbor, you can just put the box on a truck, put the box on a train car, and ship right out of the harbor. Before container shipping, harbors look like this. And if you, you look closely here, you can see that, you know, they're just taking the stuff out of the ship. There's barrels and crates and piles of stuff. One thing you see, if it rains, it's going to be a mess. Also, you know, getting enough people to move this stuff off the ship and then moving it back, you know, moving new stuff onto the ship and getting this stuff out of the harbor and onto trucks, that takes a lot of time and a lot of labor. Okay? Going through harbors is what took up most of the time for shipping. You know, the ships were in harbor more often than they were, you know, actually, you know, out there on the ocean. Another problem is stealing. All this stuff laying around, stuff was pilfered. Um, so there's stealing. There's this problem with, with things just going, going more slowly. Um, also, things were just lost. Okay, and you can see it doesn't look too orderly here. So during this era, when you're shipping stuff, um, most of the international shipping was stuff like grain, coal, iron ore, timber, maybe sometimes things like cloth, you know, bolts and bolts of cloth. Okay? Um, things that were less likely to get stolen, okay, things that were big and bulky, okay. Um, you didn't do much international shipping of consumer goods. Okay? That was very limited. Now, although you've got these container ships, you can just, you know, a factory can make a lot of container, can, consumer goods, put them in some containers. They grow to go across the ocean to the port. Crane takes off the box, puts it on a truck, and it's out of there. Okay, very quick. So container shipping increases the speed. It also increases safety of the goods. Another thing that happens is there's getting to be cheaper air travel. So there's also cheaper air freight. I should probably mention air travel is also something that's very important okay, for, for this new um, international trade. You need to send people back and forth from where you're producing things to where you're selling them. Okay? But air freight is also important. You don't usually send most of your stuff by air freight because it's still much cheaper to send it by container ship. But there's always going to be rush orders. In a paper I wrote in the World Economy, I used air freight to try to figure out what categories of goods were more speed intensive, you know, where speed was more important. What you have to do is you have to control for the weight of the good, and then controlling for the weight, you look at how much of the good then will be shipped by air freight rather than by, by surface shipping. And you find that, um, you know, things like consumer goods um, that are, you know, fashionable and need to be sold quickly, they tend to be more often sent by air freight. Also, high-tech goods like electronics, those are things where technology is changing quickly. Sometimes there's rush orders for these and you have to send them by air freight. 
Highways improve and so, do, uh, so does trucking. Okay, this becomes very important. In the United States, there's the new interstate highway system. That makes it easier to get stuff from the harbors okay, to the cities of the United States. You just put them on a truck and you, you, you ship them out. Um, in Taiwan, though, this is also important. Uh, in Taiwan, a lot of the products being produced were being produced in rural factories. It used to be hard to get the stuff from a rural factory to the harbor. It might take several days. Now it takes less than a day because you've got better highways and you've got a lot of trucks. The Taiwan government always overestimated the growth in railroad freight because they concentrated on looking at the, the big firms and the big factories. And so they tended to overestimate that. They always underestimated how much freight was going to go by truck. And that's because they, they really didn't keep as close a tabs on all the little small factories that were springing up all through the countryside. Okay. So there was a lot of congestion in Taiwan and uh, there weren't enough roads built, okay, but um, it, it, there was still improvement over time. Now, as far as this new type of trade and, and more fashionable consumer goods is concerned, the first economy to take advantage of this were the Japanese. Okay. The Japanese, um, I don't think that their com natural comparative advantage really was fast, um, you know, flexible production lines. But after World War II, everything was in chaos. Everyone had to find a new job. You know, everything was, was open. And so this was a period of a lot of flexibility. Okay. So I think the Japanese kind of made use of their adversity. And in the 1950s, based on this big export trade, their economy you know, was the first to really take off at high speed. Well, the Japanese and the, and the Hong Kong economy, those two. The Japanese were by far the biggest economy to take off at high speed. Okay. This miracle shocked the world because you know, Japan had been destroyed during the war. And 1945 to 1950, um, during the, the American occupation, um, there wasn't a lot of growth. I mean, Japan's recovery was much slower than in Europe. But then suddenly in the 1950s, Japan takes off. And that keeps growing to the 1950s, 1960s. Very quickly, the Japanese are more successful you know, after the war than they were before the war. They're richer and they're growing faster. And people say, well, what's happening? Is it, is it that having a war and destroying your economy is a, is a good growth strategy? Okay, I mean, that's, that sounds crazy, but you know, the, statistically, it almost looks like there might be something to that. Um, but you know, what happens is that the Japanese do take advantage of the American connections, the new retail revolution in the United States, okay, then their flexibility during this period of chaos, they make use of this, this problem, and they, they make lots of money on the exports. But by the 1960s, I think it's becoming clear that this isn't entire, the Japanese natural um, comparative advantage. The Japanese start moving into more things like heavy industry, where what's important is making high quality goods at a low price, and they're goods that you know you don't have to worry so much about speed. You just have to worry about efficiency. The Japanese seem to be very good at doing high quality goods and making them very efficiently. So these companies started moving more and more into this line, which is also a, a, you know, a good type of export at this time. Um, Japanese trading companies were still getting lots of orders from the United States for, for these new Japanese goods. You know, this is the period in the 1950s, as, you know, like the Sony transistor radio that invades the United States. Okay, there's, there's still you know, a, a big demand for Japanese products. Well, what happens then is, as far as electronics is concerned, it's going to wait a while, and then Japan is going to continue to do the electronics. But when you get these fashion goods in, in clothes and shoes and toys, this sort of thing, the Japanese firms were doing less and less of this, and it was becoming more and more expensive partly because labor costs were going up, the Japanese trading firms started looking for other places to do this. The first place they look are their ex-colonies, and they find Taiwan. I've already said a little bit when I talk about hats, how it was the, the old hat producers that had worked with the, the Japanese trading companies. They're the first to be contacted, and they're the first to start producing shoes that were ordered by Americans, originally from Japanese, but then the Japanese trading companies give the orders to Taiwan. So this is a, a big change after the war, okay? There's this everything now, you've got better tra transportation, better communications, you've got larger scale retailers 
okay, and because of the large scale retailers, they're willing to look abroad, okay, for their products. If you're a little mall paw store in a medium sized city, you're crazy to go looking around Asia to try to find a supplier. Okay? If you're a, a big chain, or, you know, 500 outlets across the country, going over to Japan, Taiwan, Korea, these places, looking around for maybe cheaper production, higher quality production, that makes sense. So that's what's happening in the world economy. And Taiwan is in a position to take advantage of this. Now, originally, Taiwan could not take advantage of this. Taiwan, I've already talked about this, they had an overvalued currency. Okay. Um, they weren't importing much, and a lot of what they were importing was coming as U.S. aid, so they were exporting even less. Okay. Exports at a, at a very, very low level. Now, with this um, overvalued currency, they were getting what they could from the United States aid. Beyond that, there was a big big fight for who could get the imported goods. Everybody wanted, you know, some new machine from the United States or from Japan. Um, so there was kind of a fight for this. They used rationing generally. Okay, they would ration how much um, different people could, could get of these foreign imports. And um, usually the government would get first choice and the SOEs, they, they, they would get second choice. And probably if you were a, a, a private company, unless you had pretty good political connections, you were toward the end of the line. Well, what happens here is that in the late 1950s, the U.S. starts telling Taiwan, you know, this U.S. aid isn't going to last forever. Okay. Taiwan has to figure out what are we going to do once the U.S. aid stops. And you can see down here, you know, we go down here to this, this graph that I've already shown you before. You know, the blue, that's Taiwan's exports. They're particularly low. Okay. Um, there's a lot of U.S. funding of imports, so imports are much higher. But even with these higher imports at this time, there, these are low imports compared with what Taiwan was importing before. Okay, I mean, you look at before the war, Taiwan's imports were much higher. So Taiwan is getting along with much fewer imports than it had before. And now it looks like imports are going to you know, have to fall again, okay, because the U.S. is going to quit sending Taiwan this aid. What's Taiwan do? There's basically three choices. You know, one thing you do is you say, well, we'll use our foreign reserves and we'll just, you know, buy more imports out there. You can do this if you have foreign reserves, but, you know, Taiwan didn't have foreign reserves at this time. It was very short of foreign reserves. Um, you could borrow some in the short term, but no one was going to lend you lots of foreign reserves in the long term. So that's, that's not a possibility. One thing you could do is you could import less. You say, okay, the government's not, we're not going to get free imports from the United States anymore. We'll just have to make do with, you know, maybe 60% of the imports we had been importing. This though is also not really not really thought of as a real possibility. I mean, imports were already low. The state-owned enterprises, they needed machinery, they needed raw materials, okay, the government did too. Okay? You start trying to cut this back even further. Everything had already been cut back to the bone. Everything was already, you know, being rationed. Okay. Rationing things even more. Okay, that was just almost unthinkable at this time. So you're left with one choice. You've got to figure out how to start exporting more. Okay. Basically, this was Taiwan's idea. Okay. They said, we are going to find some way that we can export enough extra stuff that we can make up for the fall in U.S. aid. How are they going to export more? Okay. Well, you know, you could try to subsidize exports, and you can give tax breaks to exporters, and they do do this. Okay, but the government budget is such that you can't do a lot of this. There's a limit to that, and that's not going to get you to where you want to be. Okay? Really, in this situation, the only thing you can do is to devalue your currency. Okay, you can also, of course, ease regulations. Okay. When I say ease regulations, one of the most important things they did is they started making it easier for the exporters to import intermediate products. Okay. That, that is, that's important. Okay. Um, there was also a lot of export regulations that made it kind of hard to get, get through customs and, and get stuff exported out of the country. They had to you know, try to streamline this. But the biggest thing they had to do you know, was they had to devalue the currency. If you have a cheaper currency, that makes all the stuff you're, do, you're making in your country cheaper on the international market. 
Okay, because you know if it's a twenty NT dollars to the U.S. dollar, then if your cost is twenty NT, um, you're going to have to sell that for at least a dollar. Okay, if you're going to if you're going to break even. Okay, in the U.S. market, if you make your currency cheaper, so now it takes thirty NT to buy a U.S. dollar. Well, if it costs you twenty NT to produce the product. You can now sell sell it for sixty six cents in the United States and, and break even. Okay? So you would need to devalue your currency and make it cheaper. Okay, the imports are going to be more expensive. It's going to be harder to buy imports. That's okay. Okay, maybe we'll just start using prices to decide who buys the imports. You know these high prices instead of just using rationing. But the important thing is you've got to make your exports cheaper. Okay, that's the key. So. That's really the only choice Taiwan had. Now, there's a lot of discussion on Taiwan's economic policy at this time, and a lot of the literature. Some of them make it sound like this was a genius idea to devalue the currency. Now, I think this is the right decision. It's not really a genius decision, though, because it's it's really the only decision one could make. There was sometimes they argue about who actually、um, figured this out. Okay, and I guess this is important. You know, maybe if If there hadn't been a few bright officials there that figured it out a little earlier,、uh, maybe it would have taken a few more months for somebody else to figure it out.、Um, but the fact was that in this sort of situation, this is going to happen. Okay, it's not just an arbitrary political decision. You know, the, the whole situation almost dictates that you're going to have to devalue your currency,、okay? and it's just a matter of how quickly you see this. Taiwan saw it pretty quickly. Okay, but、um, the people that saw it. Weren't geniuses. Okay, they were just doing what had to be done.、Okay. And I think that's a problem in a lot of the economic literature. Economists create models, and we're always asking, you know, how different economic policies will affect the economy. So we tend to think of economic policy as something like an outside force that impacts this economy. In the real world, however, though, you know, a lot of economic policy is dictated by the economy. Okay, it's not really something that comes outside of the economy. That's why when I'm describing, you know, Taiwan's economic development during the 20th century, I often tend to downplay a lot of the economic policy because I think this economic policy was just kind of dictated by the economic changes that were taking place at this time. That's not always true, but but I think it's often true. Well, what happens once the, the Taiwan government? Starts streamlining things and devalues the currency. Okay, there is a big export boom. Now the boom doesn't happen right away. They do this around 1960 to 1962. This is the period they're doing the reforms. And during this period, you still don't see a big growth,、uh, an immediate big growth in exports. It's when the Japanese trading companies find Taiwan around 1964 or so. This is when the big change comes. Okay, so you do this, you know, there was a, this reform, and then that makes the change possible. But you still got to have somebody come in and take advantage of the situation before you really get the change. From 1961 to 1971, and mainly from say 1964 to 1971, you get an increase in exports of 700 percent, just a huge growth in exports coming out of Taiwan. In 1961. Over half of the exports were food, 56 percent. A lot of this was stuff like sugar and rice that the government was exporting. 18 percent of the exports was a cloth. Okay, that was the cloth cartel that was being pushed to export more. There's also like six percent chemicals, five percent metals and manufacturing. Okay, again, these are things probably with the more politically connected cartels or are exporting. By 1971. Only 17% of the exports are food. Of these food exports, about 10% are fruits and vegetables. That's the main thing being exported, and I'll say just a, a little bit about that,、um, I guess, in the in the next section.、Okay. But the biggest exports at this time are the more speed-intensive exports, the exports that need to get out there and, and react, you know, to quickly to these changing markets. Things like clothes. Okay, clothes styles are always changing and they're seasonal. Okay. 19% of Taiwan exports were clothes in 1971. 14% were other fashion goods, primarily shoes.、Okay. 13% were electronics.、Okay. They started doing things like transistor radios.
in Taiwan, and these also because of technology or needed to be produced fast because the technology was gradually was improving fairly fast. Cloth exports had fallen to 12%, so cloth is still being exported, okay, but, but mainly it's being used, you know, to, for domestic and domestic supply and also to, to supply the clothes makers. 6% of the export is plywood, and I still haven't quite figured that out, okay, what, what's the big thing about plywood in Taiwan at this time, but maybe someday I'll, I'll learn more about plywood. So that's the big change in exports. If you look at growth in real GDP, the interesting thing here is that we can, um, you know, we can look at what the government plans thought about GDP change, you know, what they were expecting to happen to the GDP, and then you can see what actually happened. Okay. Well, the first two plans, and for the first couple of years of the third plan, okay, um, the plans were pretty accurate. Okay? I mean, you can see that they didn't always go up and down, right, with the GDP from year to year. That's because Taiwan was an agricultural economy, and you, you know you can't predict how the you know how the growing season is going to be from each year. Um, but by the end of the third plan, you can see that suddenly GDP takes off. Okay, 1964 in particular, you get a growth in real GDP of you know about 12 over 12 percent. And then you keep getting this high growth in real GDP um, all the way through, you know, and it goes on past the, I take this out to 1972, it goes on long past that time. Okay? But what you can see about the plans is that the planners didn't plan for this. Okay? There was never an idea that, you know, we're going to have these reforms and these reforms are going to now allow high speed growth. Okay, the government didn't think this way. They said, we're going to do these reforms, we're going to devalue the currency, and then we're just going to pray that somehow our exports are going to grow enough that they're going to cover um, the amount of U.S. aid we're, we're missing. Actually, the exports grow way beyond, you know, what the U.S. aid had been, you know, had been giving them. Okay, so, um, and, and it's, so by the fourth plan, um, well, there was already this burst of GDP growth, but the government didn't think it would continue. Um, they actually planned for a little slower growth because they said, well, maybe last time we grew a little, grew a little more, maybe this time we'll probably grow a little slower. Um, but you kept growing fast in Taiwan. The fifth plan, okay, by the fifth plan, by the, the, the last years of the fifth four-year plan, is growth of over 13%. Okay? Um, again, the government just keeps planning 7% growth. You know, the government never really trusts its luck on this. Okay, this it's much later before they start really planning for high-speed growth. Okay? So some people, if you read old literature on this, they sometimes concentrate on what the government's doing and they almost give you the impression that maybe this is a, all part of a government plan. Okay, it's not part of a government plan. It's something that takes everybody by surprise. You know, and, and, you know, that's not a criticism of the government. It, I'm sure it took all the business people by surprise too. It was, it was just a very surprising thing that this happened. Now, one thing I've done in this chart is instead of starting at zero at the bottom, if you look at that y-axis, I start at 3% annual growth. The reason is that um, you know, the population was growing about 3%. So by starting at 3% here, the graph is kind of showing you, you know, you can kind of more better visualize what's happening to, to real GDP growth per, per, per capita. This is annual growth in real exports. Okay? You can see here, again, the government very much underestimates. The government generally thinks that exports are going to increase about 10% per year. Well, I think if you try to average this out, you know, after, 19, after 1962, um, you're going to probably find that exports are increasing 25 to 30% a year. Okay, it's increasing much faster. And the government has, its, you know, has chances in its plans to, to try to you know, account for this and to try to say, oh, we're going to... You know, maybe we should set these um, export figures up higher. Okay? And this is one reason that the government falls behind in its investment in transportation, because they don't really realize how much their exports are actually going to increase. And, of course, imports will also increase along with these exports. Um, in 1963, you see the biggest growth in exports, and that actually doesn't have much to do with what happens later. That's because the Japanese market opens up and starts allowing in more um, Taiwanese bananas and I think pineapples. Okay, that's a big thing at the start. Okay, but after that, you know, it's just systematically 
exports grow much faster than the government predicts. And all the way up to the fifth plan, you know, the government doesn't really, you know, doesn't really understand this. Okay, they, um, they keep predicting that exports will keep growing at 10%. According to the government plan, if you know if you just follow all the government plans, and you know every four years they have a chance to redo the plans, okay. But if you look at the plans, you find that if everything had grown as planned in all of these four-year plans, by 1980 exports would have been 20% of Taiwan's GDP, and you know that's kind of what would be necessary to make up for the loss in U.S. aid. Okay, I mean I think a little more than necessary to make up for the loss in U.S. aid, but not much more. Actually, though, we're getting, you know, exports going up to 50% of GDP. So the government never really um, understood the export sector very well. And I told you that the government's ideal was to move more towards self-sufficiency. Okay? So um, they tend to emphasize things more along the line of import substitution, okay? thinking this was the way to go. The exports were good for the time being, as far as they were concerned. They liked them. Okay, but, um, but they thought what they needed, really needed to concentrate on was figuring out how to become more self-sufficient. Okay, so, you know, this is the period of the GDP takeoff. Okay. In the next section, I want to look a little closer at this big consumer goods boom. Okay, what's happening during this boom? And um, then I'm going to, to go on and um, we'll look at why the boom happens. Okay, I'm going to talk a little more about speed intensity. I think that was Taiwan's big comparative advantage that helped Taiwan grow so fast. And then in the last unit, I want to talk about one particular industry, the bicycle industry, okay, and, and how it was affected okay, by this speed intensive production um, methodology. Because you usually don't think of bicycles as being so speed intensive, but I think it was Taiwan's advantage in speed intensity that turned Taiwan into one of the most important bicycle producers in the world.